Well, hey, this morning, uh, we're going to start uh, embarking on our study of the book of Romans. And uh, the desire is just to go verse by verse, uh, try to keep things in context so that we, under, we can understand the Bible um, the way that it was written and intended to be understood. And that's obviously the goal as we study. You can join me in Romans chapter 1. But remember, as we get into the study, this book is all about God's righteousness. See, mankind has a problem. Mankind has a problem called sin. We don't have the righteousness required to join God in a heaven for eternity because there's a penalty for our our sin. And that the Bible says it's the penalty is death. Um, The Bible also says that there's no way to regain this righteousness on our own. Many people think that if you just do a good enough good works and you and you really just work really hard that you can become righteous enough to go to heaven. Well, the, the book of Romans and the Bible as a whole, but the book of Romans specifically is going to tell us that's not how you gain a righteousness to go to heaven. It's not by doing good works. It's not by trying harder. It's actually by giving up. That doesn't, that doesn't sound right, does it? That doesn't sound religious, does it? That's my point. <laughs> Religion is, is many times the problem because what God has done is he's taken his only begotten son and sent him to be the provision, the answer for the righteousness that you and I lack, the forgiveness of sins by dying in our place and rising again. And so as we look at the book of Romans, not only is uh, Paul going to delineate how we get that righteous standing, but after we get that righteous standing, how can you now live a life in righteousness, pleasing to God? And that's all here in the book of Romans. And so we'll try to Uh, as best we can, keep that as our primary point of reference as we study through. But let's go ahead and just dive in, and then we'll get kind of a running start on the passage. I'm going to reread the first seven verses, and then we'll go back through and dissect these uh, one by one. Verse 1, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, According to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you are also the called of Jesus Christ to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we start here in verse one and it's, um, It's important just to kind of start with the Apostle Paul. Um, And we know a little bit about Paul, that he was what I would call a purebred Jew. In other words, his mom and dad were both Jewish. He had the right kind of pedigree. He was of the tribe of Benjamin, which was a a tribe of great pride to be a part of Benjamin. They had a good reputation for the most part. Obviously, none of the tribes had perfect reputations as you read through the Old Testament. But he had a good reputation coming from the tribe of Benjamin. This is also important. He was a Roman citizen. And he wasn't a Roman citizen. In those days, you could purchase your citizenship um, if you wanted to, if you had enough money. But he was actually a Roman citizen by birth, which leads us to know or understand that his dad was a Roman citizen as well. And he was born in the town or the city of Tarsus, which is where he grew up. And Tarsus was a prestigious city of the time. And so there's speculation that Paul's parents were wealthy, could afford to give him the greatest type of education uh, that might be afforded to a young man. In fact, Uh, In the ancient world, it ranked up there with Athens and Alexandria in terms of the type of scholarship, the type of education a young man could get. But not only was he uh, growing up in Tarsus, but we know that he was trained in the Old Testament scriptures by one of the best rabbis of his day, Gamaliel. Gamaliel is actually written about in extra biblical sources as being a rabbi of rabbis. And so typically what Jewish families would do is at the age of 13, they would send, if they didn't live in Jerusalem, they would send their children to Jerusalem to live and study under these famous rabbis. And most likely that's what Paul did at the age of 13, sitting at the feet of this great rabbi. And so he had a great concept and understanding of the Old Testament. But you know, like many Jews of the day, he had missed the point for many years as to what God was actually doing in terms of making man righteous. And so we'll uh, explore that further as we go through. But Paul had grown up studying the law. He became a strict uh, 
Pharisee passionate about the law of God. In fact, Pharisees were so passionate, they took the 613 laws of the Old Testament and then they insulated it with some, some speculate another 500 or so laws. It's like telling the, um, it's like telling your kids, don't get next to the edge because you're going to fall off the cliff. And sometimes you don't even say that. You say, don't even get 10 feet next to the, <laughs> don't even come within 10 feet of that edge because you know how kids are. Uh, most of the time they come up and toe the line. So you, you kind of back off the standards. And so the Pharisees did that too, to try to avoid sinning. That was their passion. Paul was a strict Pharisee. In fact, he calls himself a Pharisee of Pharisees. Maybe a, a hero to other Pharisees in terms of the strictness uh, with which he observed the law. As it relates to our epistle, um, he had never been to the Church of Rome up to this point in time. This was a church that had been founded, planted without his assistance. Now, indirectly, he might have been involved, um, but directly he wasn't. He hadn't been there. Now, we gather that just from the epistle itself, and as we follow the history, of the book of Acts, we find out that he doesn't actually make it to Rome until the end of the book of Acts, Acts 28, and he doesn't get there the way that he had planned to get there. Um, in fact, as we see, um, again, context, he, he wrote this epistle while he was wintering in Corinth. He was wintering there. He was planning a trip back to Jerusalem. If you recall, the saints in Jerusalem were very poor. Many of them had lost their lands. They were starving, many of them. And so what Paul was tasked uh, to do by the elders in the church in Jerusalem was to collect money from the different Gentile churches that he was visiting and then take back gifts. And so Paul is wintering in Corinth when he writes this letter. He's getting ready to take a trip back to Jerusalem. He's timing it so he can be there to celebrate Pentecost and to deliver this gift to the saints. And his intention after he delivered this gift, celebrated Pentecost, was to hop on a ship and head straight back to Rome. That was his intention. Because he wanted to get to Rome to do what? To jump off and go to Spain, which was the end of the known world of that day. I think Paul in his mind says, hey, we're close. We're close to filling this great commission to the end, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. We're, we're close. I'm going to hit Rome. I'm going to visit there and I'm going to use them as a jumping off point to Spain. And so I think he's thinking this in his mind. Now, God had other plans, didn't he? Because as Paul goes back to Jerusalem, we read historically that he gets arrested in the temple. He gets put in jail in Caesarea for two years. He appeals to Caesar. They send him to Rome. He's involved in a shipwreck and just kind of a crazy trip over to Rome. And then he's in ha under house arrest in Rome for two years. And that's how he gets to Rome eventually. And so he had written them to tell of his intentions to visit them shortly. And then secondly, he records a systematic and detailed presentation of the gospel that he preached right here in this book that we're about to study. If you wanted to know what Paul would do to establish believers, to lead people to the Lord, to explain how you can get God's righteousness, to explain how you can live righteously, Look no further than the book of Romans. It's a systematic, detailed, organized explanation of how all of those things work out. And so this message is for everybody. This is a book that we need to understand so that we too might be established. And so as we go on in verse 1, we, we've only covered one word so far. Um, but we're going to move a little bit quicker. We also see that Paul calls himself a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Very interesting word because... You know, there are six different Greek words that he could have chose to, ex to explain or express servitude in the language. He chooses bondservant, the, the, the strongest word possible. Um, this was different. This, this word was different than just your average slave in the market. In fact, some of your translations may have the word slave. That's a good translation of this word. But it doesn't c capture probably the nuance that's associated with this word, which is this. He was like a slave, but sometimes in this culture, after slaves had served their time, if it was an indentured servitude type situation, or they were sold off to, to pay off a debt, or they sold themselves off, they would pay their time and then they would be released. Um, or some masters would just grant some of their slaves freedom. A bond servant would be somebody that was granted freedom, but chose to remain a slave of that master. For whatever reason, they, they love that master. They, they got treated better under the master's care than they did when they were managing their own money or finances. But there were reasons to do that. In the Jewish mindset, this was actually an honor, a privilege to be 
a bond servant. In fact, we, you go back to as early as the, the law given on Mount Sinai, Exodus 21, you've got this concept of bond servant um, shared there in Exodus 21, 5 through 6, if you want to write that down. Exodus 21, 5 through 6. And what they would do with bond servants in this culture is if a slave said, hey, I'm free, but I want to stay with the master, they would take him down in a ceremony and they would nail a nail into his ears called an auger and they would bend it in there and, and keep it in there. And that was the sign of a bond servant. And many people, many Jews especially, would wear that symbol with pride. I, I was set free, but I have chose to remain serving this master. And so Paul identifies himself in this way uh, as a bond servant of Jesus Christ. And then we notice this next phrase in verse one, he's called to be an apostle. He was called to be an apostle. And we know from scripture that he was a, his appointment was as an apostle to the Gentiles. He was called to share the message with the Gentiles. And I, you know, as we look at Paul's background, how, how shocking is that to see this strict law abiding Pharisees that had no use or interest for Gentile believers or Gentiles in general, called them dogs, called them. I mean, part of the religious Jewish man's prayer of every day that he prayed was, thank God, I'm not a Gentile. That was their prayer. They hated Gentiles. And so for God to take this Pharisee of Pharisees and make him an apostle to the Gentiles, there had to be some heart change there. And God worked in this man's heart to the point, as we looked at the book of Philemon uh, a few weeks ago, that he called a Jew or a Gentile slave, the lowest of low, my own heart. I'll take his place, Philemon. And so you see God working in his heart. And so he's called to be an apostle. Um, we could get into a lot of debate. You know, I, I, this is kind of one of those fun questions. Was Paul the, is Paul the 12th apostle? You know, Judas forfeited his office. He, he committed suicide. And we, we have the account in Acts 1 where they appointed Matthias um, by lots. And a lot of people say, well, that wasn't valid. That wasn't this. I, I, I just happen to take the text for what it says. I think it was valid. I think Math- Matthias is the 12th apostle. But I do think Paul is on par with the 12 apostles. And, and I don't think anyone would argue that he was the key doctrinal communicator for church truth. In fact, if you took Paul's epistles out of the New Testament... Um, it'd be hard to put, piece together some things. So he kind of reveals that God used him as an instrument. And so he was a key doctrinal communicator, foundational to the church. For you basketball fans, I would call Paul the, the, the and one apostle. You know, there's 12 apostles and one. He's kind of equivalent on par with the 12, but I don't think he's one of the 12. That's just my take. And we can talk about that later if you're interested. Um, but then we go on in verse one. We see that not only is he a bond servant, of Jesus Christ. we see that he's called to be an apostle. And then he mentions this next phrase that he separated to the gospel of God. He separated to the gospel of God. And I want to just make a point there because notice that he's, he's not just verbalizing what he's separated from. He's verbalizing what he's separated to. And I think that's a key point that we need to take in mind because so many times as, as Christians is, uh, and I remember, I remember when I started getting interested in spiritual things and I began to try to explain to some of my worldly friends, why I wouldn't be doing some of the things that I had normally done. It, it always came out what I'm separated from. It was, you know, Jimmy, I, you know, I'm not going to go drinking with you anymore. I'm not going to go to the nightclubs with you anymore. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. And it always became what I was separated from. And it wasn't until I saw this in the book of Romans that it was something I'm separated to. It's, it's a positive separation. See, I'm, I'm not, it, I am separated from those things, but it's because I'm separated to. You know, there's a, there's a difference in running to something and running a, away from something. There's just a different focus. And see, I think Paul's focus is he's separated too. Why do I say that? Well, because as we get into verse two, he loses his train of thought. He, he doesn't even finish his greetings until verse seven because he mentions the word gospel. And he's like, oh, and let me tell you about that. <laughs> I, I'm distracted now. Let me talk about the gospel and the person of the gospel for the next three to four verses. And you see that he's, his mindset is I'm separated to something. It's not about what I don't do anymore. It's about what I, who I am, where I'm going. That's his mindset here. And so we see that he had been separated 
to the gospel at a point in time. And, and the, the verb tense here is perfect. It's, it's a participle. But the idea is that his position of separated to the gospel remained, continued. That was how he lived his life. He remained separated to the gospel. Again, most of the time when we talk about our Christianity, it's generally what we're separated from, not what we're separated to. And Paul's mindset was what we were separated to. Now, as we get to verse two, I kind of alluded to this. Paul gets distracted. He, verse seven should actually be verse two. Now, that's how you typically start letters. Hey, I'm Paul. I'm writing to you Romans. That, those should be together. But you're going to see that he gets distracted by the gospel. It's a, it's a beautiful thing, as you see, because he, he, he does this a lot. Paul does this a lot. You know, and it's interesting because as I see Paul, Paul got distracted by the gospel. What do you get distracted by? You ever, you ever just taken account of the things that you talk about? You ever just notice in your own heart when you get excited to talk about something? You know, I know... There's certain people in my life, and, and I'm, we're from Texas, obviously. But if I bring up the Dallas Cowboys and Tony Romo, man, look out. I can sit down. This person will carry the conversation for the next 20 minutes. Going to tell me all the stats about Tony Romo. Going to tell me what his wife looks like, how many kids he has, why he should be playing over Dak Prescott right now. I mean, all these things that are so important, you know, in life. I mean, you just get the whole thing. But the same person, I could talk about Jesus Christ and they clam up. And they're believers. You know, I used to comment to my wife, Carrie, there were times where you'd go to church and I said, you know, I talk more about Jesus Christ during the week with people than I do Sunday at church. Because, you know, Sunday at church, what are we talking about? Well, some of us are talking about football. Some of us are talking about scrapbooking. Some of us are talking about homeschooling. Some of us are talking about work. What jazzes you up? What distracts you? You, you know, I mean, that's, I'm sure something's coming to your mind right now. What fires you up in life? Is it something you're doing at work? Is it some product that you sell? Is it some event that you're coordinating at your work? What fires you up? What jazzes you up? If you don't know, ask somebody around you. They'll tell you. Paul got jazzed up by the gospel. Paul got jazzed up. His, his uh, switch got flipped the second you talked about the gospel. And why not? That's how we get to heaven, folks. That's how our eternal destiny has changed. Because Jesus Christ died in your place for your sins and rose again on the third day. What's better to get distracted by than that? Is there anything else worth getting distracted by than that? And so we see in verse 2... That this gospel was not something that Paul just made up. It wasn't, it wasn't even something that, that God created as a plan B when the fall happened in the garden. This was a prophesied event. This was God's plan. And so we see that this was a prophesied event in verse 2. And he says, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And so we're talking about the Old Testament here that was promised in the Holy Scriptures. And this word which there in the verse just refers to the gospel. And this is why we say, we say Paul is getting distracted because in verse 1 he says, separated to the gospel of God, which, referring back to the gospel, he promised through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And so what is the gospel? Well, the gospel is a simple message. It centers around a person in history, who did something 2,000 years ago. The gospel's not you. You're not the gospel. Walking an aisle is not the gospel. Praying a prayer is not the gospel. The gospel is the God-man, Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, died for your sins and rose again on the third day. That's the gospel. There's no bad news in that message because this is the way that God makes sinners righteous. You want to go to heaven? Don't try being a good person. Good people don't make it to heaven. Sinners make it to heaven. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. And if you're a sinner, you qualify. God can make the the worst sinner righteous. Jesus, yeah, thanks. Me too, Harry. Yeah. I saw a lot of hands go up. Yeah. God can make the worst sinner righteous because of this message right here. 
Jesus died for your sins. He paid the penalty that you deserved. And he rose again on the third day. That's the gospel that we preach. In fact, we find that very clearly in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 1 through 4. And for time, um, I won't go there. But jot that down because he, he repeats a phrase there in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. And it's, and it's simply this. I'll quote it for you. Um, and you tell me if you can hear it. Um, Christ, who, who died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. See, this was a, a prophesied event. This is something that God had revealed in his word through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. He revealed that Jesus would not only come, which we celebrate at Christmas, but that he would die, he would suffer for our sins, and that he would rise again on the third day. See, God prophesied this through the Scriptures. In fact, God planned to execute this before the foundation of the world. And we see the first promise of the gospel in Genesis 3.15. And it's this, if you will. I, I've put some picture references up there for you to, to see it. But let me read it for you. All the way back in Genesis, immediately following the fall, God says this to Adam and Eve. And I will put enmity. Uh, he's speaking to the serpent. Uh, this is in the context of Adam and Eve uh, and the serpent present. But he's speaking to the serpent And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And we see in this the promise that Jesus would one day and would one day come and crush the serpent's head, would steal the the sting of death, if you will, which is which is hell. Every man born after Adam deserved to go to hell. That's you. That's me. The beauty of the gospel is that Jesus came to save us. You ever wonder why the Bible calls Jesus the Savior? We need saving. We need saving. And so you see that this was something that was prophesied about. And then we see in verse 3, we see who the who of the gospel. Because the gospel involves a person. Verse 3 says, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh. You know, what's interesting about the way Paul writes this in verse three is he is speaking very uniquely of Jesus Christ. Um, we don't pick this up in the English translation just because it wouldn't read normal. We'd say, wow, that's just that's so choppy. That doesn't read right. But, you know, in the Greek, it, it would be concerning his the son. Jesus Christ are the Lord. There's a there's a uniqueness. That Paul has even mentioning Jesus Christ, our Lord. He is the unique one and only son of God, the unique one and only Lord, the unique one and only promised Messiah. The one we were looking for since Genesis 315 to come to crush the serpent's head. So there's a uniqueness here in the who of the gospel. And we see that the gospel is about a person. Jesus, the Christ, who is our Lord and even worked into that Greek word curios was a very technical term uh, used to translate the Hebrew word Yahweh. And so when the Jewish person, because of the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint, when they saw that word Kyrios, they, they perked up. That was the name of their covenant keeping God. And so for, for Paul to say these things, I mean, it becomes so commonplace in church and in our culture to hear this phraseology. But when Paul said that, that would have been a shocking statement for a Jew. What? Jesus Christ? Yahweh? The Yahweh? That's how they would have read it. And so there's this not so subtle. (laughs) I don't think Paul was probably a very subtle person. A not so subtle reference to Jesus's deity just in his title, just in the way Paul wrote this phrase. We we see that come through. We're going to see in verses three and four that we're going to learn two things about Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's going to describe him. Um, In two ways. And first, we see in verse three, he was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh. He had a human lineage. That's what we celebrated this morning with the lighting of the Advent candle. Jesus Christ, the son of God, came in the form of human flesh. And he didn't come as a conquering king sitting on one of those floats that people carry through town. He came in a very humble way in a manger. I mean, they didn't even have room for him in a hotel. I mean, good night. 
That's just crazy, isn't it? But he was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. We see that phrase, according to the flesh. He was born. He was born a child in Bethlehem to a real human mother, Mary. And we read about that story in the Christmas story. See that in the Gospels. We see that his earthly lineage went all the way back to David. That was a requirement. That was a requirement that it would be tied to David. That was the promise of the Davidic covenant is that he would have a descendant to rule on his throne forever. And it had to be this Messiah. And so we, we had to have a, a Messiah, a savior whose lineage earthly went back to David. And, you know, as you look at the gospels, what's beautiful about that is uh, Mary's lineage, his, his bloodline went all the way back to David. And we find that in the book of Luke. And we also see that through his legal adoption through Joseph. In Matthew, his lineage went back to David. Every point of reference that you could, uh, you could figure out for Jesus in terms of his lineage, it all went back to David. In fact, when you see the Pharisees trying to disprove who Jesus was, we see that he, it was undisputable that he was the seed of David. Why? Because the Pharisees didn't even make that argument. They had the records right there in the temple. They could have just nixed him and his qualifications quickly if they just produced the records and say, see, actually, you see this little jump right here. You see this little deviation. He actually doesn't go back up to David. And they could have just showed everybody and that would have just squelched everything. But that was indisputable. They didn't even bring it up. I'm sure they checked it out. They didn't even bring it up because it wasn't a good argument. It was indisputable that his lineage went all the way back to David according to the flesh. And so as many objections as they raised, this was not one of them to discredit his unique qualification to be the Messiah. And then we see in verse four, we see his divine nature communicated. So we saw that he was fully human. He had a human birth and a, and a human history there, if you will. But in verse four, we also see that he was declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. And this word declared probably um, would be better defined marked out. Okay. Jesus was marked out or declared as God's one and only son in a very powerful way by the resurrection from the dead. Um, you know, the word marked out, think of it as God put a highlighter on Jesus. Those of you back at the, the kids still use highlighters in school. Homeschoolers, y'all use highlighters when you're studying. Back in the day, we used highlighters, didn't we? Back in the old days when I went to school. <laughs> and back in the old, old days when some of the rest of y'all went to school. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> ah, it's a joke. I'll, I'll probably get it for that one. Um, I'm just talking about people, you know, 100 years and older. That's what I mean by that comment. So um, we use highlighters. We use highlighters. Why do we do that? We're, mark, we're marking something out that we thought was important. Um, as if the bold words in the book weren't enough. Sometimes we, we gave it a little bit extra highlight. God's highlighted Jesus Christ. God is pointing his finger. We're going to see that in Romans um, chapter 3 at the end. When God begins to reveal how you can gain his righteousness. The idea is that God is pointing a finger at his son. He's highlighting his son. He's saying, look over there. Look to my provision. He's pointing. He wants us to be enraptured with Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. And so Jesus was marked out by, by God as his one and only son. He was highlighted, if you will. And we see that God raised Jesus from the dead because he lived a perfect life. His sacrifice was acceptable to God the Father. And if you have any question as to whether or not God accepted Jesus' sacrifice, just look at the resurrection. If there was something faulty in what he did, something faulty in the way that he lived his life, something faulty in which he wouldn't qualify, there'd be a, a grave today that you could go see Jesus's grave and he'd be there. His bones would be decaying, he'd, but he'd be there wrapped in that linen. He'd still be there. The stone would be shut. There'd probably be other bodies in there with him too, uh, from Joseph's family, Joseph of Arimathea, but it, he's not there. The tomb is empty. God accepted his sacrifice. And it was based on the fact, you, you notice this phrase in verse 4, that he, he declared him to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. And I believe what he's talking about there is his holy nature. We get to probably a great exposition of this verse is found in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. 
which says that Jesus was in very nature or very form, the word is used, but it's speaking of his essence, his nature. He was God. He, he didn't cease to be God when he took on human flesh. He just added human flesh to who he already was. He remained God the entire time he was on this earth. He's been God from eternity past and he will be God to eternity future. None of that changes because that's who he is. And so as we look at this, God raised Jesus from the dead saying, I put my stamp of approval on what he did for you. I put my stamp of approval on what Jesus did by dying in your place as a substitute. And now the question for each one of us is, will you accept the same way to heaven that God will accept? That's the question for each one of us. That's the question for everybody in the world. Are you satisfied with what God is satisfied with? God is satisfied by the death of his son in your place. So much so that he rose him from the dead. Are you satisfied with him? And if you are, the Bible exhorts you to put your faith in him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. It's as simple as that because Jesus paid it all. And see, that's why Paul's distracted. This is an awesome message. There's, there's no message on earth greater than this message to know that you can be made righteous in the eyes of a holy God. You can be made righteous in the eyes of a just God who has to give you what you deserve. Now, the beautiful thing about the gospel is Jesus stepped in front, took what you deserve so that you can get something you don't deserve. That's called grace. You can get something you don't deserve. God can remain holy. God can remain just because he executed his justice on Jesus Christ. So he can give you something you don't deserve. It's called heaven. It's called eternal life. It's called forgiveness of sins. It's called a righteous standing before him. All of these beautiful things that we get because of what Jesus did for you and for me. You know, it's interesting when we preach the gospel in our day. What aspect of the gospel is generally left out if we leave out uh, something? It's interesting. The apostles, um, if, if they were moving through a section or uh, maybe not delineating it, uh, you know, in full, like, like he did in 1 Corinthians 15, they'll typically just preach the resurrection. You'll see that they, they preach the resurrection. They preach the resurrection. They preach the resurrection. Why is that? Because to have a resurrection, you have to have a death. It's implied by the term, you know, and it's interesting as we preach the gospel today, we generally leave out the resurrection. If we leave out one of the two death or resurrection, we generally preach the death of Christ and we leave out the resurrection. That's just kind of a interesting, I I just think it is an interesting point because it's the resurrection that we look to, to say, you know what? God accepted what Jesus did. And so that is, um, unfortunately in our day that has become so commonplace to hear about Jesus's resurrection and yet it should captivate our minds and thinking. I mean, here's a man who was risen from the dead. That's amazing. That doesn't happen every day. You know, not even in Georgia, somewhere nice like Georgia, it just doesn't happen. And yet so many times that's what we leave out. That's there's power. He, in fact, verse four, he declared, Him to be the son of God with power. There's power in this message of the resurrected Christ. So we had mentioned grace. Uh, Paul brings that up in verse five as we move on. He says this through him, speaking of, of Jesus, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among the nations for his name. And so we see this. Concept that it's through Jesus that we receive grace. Why can God give you something you don't deserve? Because Jesus got what you deserved. See, through him, you can receive grace. Through him, Paul received grace and his calling as an apostle. And so we see that it's through Jesus Christ that he received grace and his calling uh, as an apostle. And, And also just notice this is a subtle observation, but notice what comes first. Grace comes first then service. Grace comes first, then calling. See, grace is always going to precede service. When you look at Jesus and the way he discipled his disciples, the calling was always to himself, then to, to service. And so many times in Christianity, we just get the cart before the horse. We just get it backwards. And we see somebody that's excited about the Lord. And we're like, man, put that dude to work, put that gal to work, get them busy. You know, and many times they need to take the position of Mary. Sit down at his feet, observe, enjoy, 
learn about your Savior, learn from him. And then as, as God prepares his messenger, then go out and serve. But you'll just notice this, this um, order throughout the New Testament. And so it's just uh, important, I think, to bring that out here in verse 5. Now, what reason did we receive grace and or uh, why did Paul receive grace and apostleship? Why did we receive grace and this call to service, if you want to put it that way? See, ultimately, so that he and others that he taught, which would include us as we're studying his epistle, would obey God and his word for his glory. That's ultimately why um, God gave us grace. That's the ultimate, if you want to call it the result. Uh, we see it described in, in, later in Romans as being conformed to the image of Christ, living a life that's, that's pleasing to him. And so we see that here in verse 5. He says, through him we have received grace and apostleship. Notice that next word, for, there's our reason, obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Now, one of the things we need to talk about here is, is the proper order, okay? Because, again, in Christianity, it's so easy to get the cart before the horse. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is simply this. This is an obedience that comes from faith, okay? It's, it's really, it, it's clear um, in the original language because uh, faith is actually a genitive. And it, you might say it this way, it's the obedience that belongs to faith. Or you might say it this way, I, I like it this way because I think visually it gives us an understanding of what's being communicated. It's the obedience that springs from faith. Obedience is not the horse, and so much of Christian teaching and Christian emphasis is on obedience being the horse. Obedience is the carriage. Faith is the horse. That's what this passage is teaching. This is why you can line this up with scriptures when it says, walk by faith. Romans 117, Romans uh, 117, the just shall live by faith. The life, Galatians 2.20, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the son of God. See, faith has got to be the driver in our Christian experience. And so, so many times we get this backwards. Contrary to popular belief, obedience is not the key to the Christian life. Wow, that sounds like heresy. I know, I grew up in church. That, sound, that does sound like heresy. I almost questioned put it in there. I don't want to get fired, you know, after a couple months here. But you know, when it's true, it's true. And we need to challenge our thinking. If some of us have never thought this way, if we think that obedience is the key word in the Christian life, and if you don't know whether or not you think it, just listen to yourself. Listen to the way you talk to your kids. Listen to the way you talk to your spouse. Listen to the way you talk to other Christian friends in terms of the Christian life. See, obedience needs to, to trail along. I'm not saying don't obey. <laughs> Let me clarify. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that if you live a life with the cart before the horse and obedience is your buzzword, you will live a life dominated by sin. I'm just trying to help. The, the Bible doesn't want you to crank out the Christian life in your own strength. The Bible does not want you focus on obey, 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 obey. The Bible wants you to have a relationship with your Savior who's also called your life. As you walk moment by moment in enjoyment and dependence upon him. Obedience is going to spring out of that. That was Paul's message. In fact, we're going to see a man who wanted to obey, who wanted to live life by the rules, uh, a Christian man named Paul, the apostle in Romans seven and go read Romans seven and tell me how that works out for him. The things I don't want to do, I keep doing the things I don't want to do. I, I, I keep doing and, and he's all over the place. He's a wreck. And unfortunately, many of us live our Christian life that same way. We're just wrecks, aren't we? We barely put one foot in front of the other to come here on Sunday morning sometimes, myself included, when I'm walking and living in this manner. See, faith is the key to the Christian life. In fact, as you look all throughout the Bible, we're going to see that faith always precedes acceptable obedience. Don't believe me? Go to Hebrews 11 and just read the chapter. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. By faith, Abel obeyed, offered a more excellent sacrifice. By faith, Noah obeyed. He built an ark. By faith, Abraham obeyed. But notice what leads. Notice what the source is. 
Notice what the horse is. It's faith. It's, it's a walk of faith. God never designed us to live independently of him. He only designed us to live dependently on him. And so that ought to question everything that we do in life. We ought to start viewing it through this lens. Am I walking by faith or am I just doing it to do it? Am I just cranking it out to cranking it out? Am I just doing it so other people at church will think that I'm spiritual and holy? Forget about us. Don't worry about what we think of you. I mean, in a, in a good way, I'm not saying just, you know, come in and be rip roaring and, and obnoxious, but I'm saying, forget about what we might think of you. What does the Lord think of you? Are you walking in dependence upon him? And so even though this is very subtle, I mean, you can see this is just a salutation that Paul's introducing the epistle, but it's rich. There's lots of good stuff here for us. That's the proper order. Faith, obedience. And you know what I love about this, this illustration of the cart before the horse is notice the cart is ready. Notice the cart has wheels. Notice the cart is hooked up. God wants us to live in good works, but he wants us to live in a way that we live out good works in an acceptable fashion. And that's as we're depending on the Lord. And as we hook up to that power wagon right there, trusting the Lord, walking by faith, walking in the spirit, obedience is going to spring forth out of that. And then the Christian life is going to be a joy. There's the Bible is actually true. There's, there's abundant life for us here. I mean, we can believe that, but that's where it needs to start. Get the cart back where it belongs and, and get faith out and start enjoying your savior on a day to day basis and see the, the miraculous and amazing things that God will do in our lives. And then he's going to describe the recipients. Let's go on in verse six. He finally gets back to his introduction he, out of his distraction. He says, among whom uh, you also are, are the called of Jesus Christ. And then verse seven, to all who are in Rome, uh, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see this concept in verse six, that they are uh, the called. We also see he, he mentions among whom. So he's, you know, these are uh, going back to verse five. These are part of the nations that he's writing to the Roman believers. They comprise part of that group. But uh, this word called is an, is an interesting word. Um, they were, it's a word typically used to designate those invited to a banquet. They were called. Um, of course, we have other stories in the gospels about people being called to a banquet, but they didn't what? They didn't respond. You know, you ever, of course, this doesn't happen very much anymore. You know, I remember growing up as a kid, we used to play outside all the time. Um, and it's not that kids don't play outside now. It's usually fenced in in our backyard is where they play. But I, I remember riding down the road, you know, blocks, miles, sometimes it seemed like a mile down on my bike. And, you know, you, you kind of had the general idea of when you needed to be home for supper, you know, but there, there was, there was a couple times I was engaged in playing and I missed the call, you know. And that didn't go over too well when I got home, you know, I, I missed the call. But as soon as I respond to the call, I'm, I'm one of the called. And every night, my brother and I eventually responded to the call. and We were the called, if you will. And, and part of the reason was, is, is we responded to it. And so we we're in the house. We got to partake of the meal. You know, in our day, uh, as, as God says in, in uh, multiple places, it was just John 3, 16 is the easiest one. Whosoever will. He's calling to everybody, but the people who respond are designated the called ones. They respond by faith. And so they're designated the called ones. And that's what I believe we see here in verse six is really just a synonym for describing them as believers. They're the called. They've responded to the gospel and they were the called of Jesus Christ. And the idea is that they belong to him. Uh, he's not their, their owner, but also their source of life as we've described uh, a little bit. And then finally, in verse seven, we see that they're described really in two ways here. Paul, Paul kind of um, separates it, but he calls them um, this. He says they're, they're the beloved of God. OK, we see that in verse seven. Um, interesting about this word, it's got its root word meaning in the word agape. And, and we all have heard of agape love. It's an unconditional love. You might call it the all give love. But when he says that they are beloved of God, what he's saying is they are the unconditionally loved ones of God. And that describes every believer in Jesus Christ. That means 
I can't do anything to separate myself from the love of Christ. Well, we're going to read that's exactly what it means. That's exactly the wording that Paul uses in Romans 8. You mean unconditional means unconditional? Yeah, it does. That's what it, that's what it means. I mean, even in, if you're an, a language expert, that's what it means. Unconditional means there's no conditions needed to be fulfilled to be loved by God. When you're a believer in Jesus Christ, isn't that an incredible position that you can just enjoy and own on a daily basis? Because do you live perfectly? I, I don't. And it's in those moments that I don't say, wow, look how good I am. Look how I'm improving. I'm, look how much I'm improving. There's some days I feel like I'm going the opposite direction. And you know what? God, God calls me a beloved of God. Wow. Because of Jesus Christ and what he did, not because of anything I did, but because of what he did. Isn't that a beautiful position? Isn't that a wonderful place and a wonderful truth to know? And then he also says, called to be saints. Now, this is one of those situations where um, the translators added to be for clarity. And I think they cleared it up um, about as muddy as the Mississippi on this one. But I am getting. I mean, they tried, right? But, it, but to be is not there. In fact, you'll see it in your translations. A lot of times it's in italics. So it's not there in the language. But what he said is called saints. And, and I think that this gives us a better understanding of what Paul is saying. He's not saying that we're called to act saintly or to be saintly in our daily lives. Although the Bible teaches that this verse doesn't teach that what he's talking about is our position. You are not only unconditionally loved of God, but you are separated to God for his purpose. And where were you separated to? We learn elsewhere in scriptures at the moment you put your faith in Christ, God puts you in Jesus Christ. You are separated unto him. You're unconditionally loved. And this is how Paul starts the letter. And then finally, the last phrase in verse seven, grace to you and peace from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And and this is a standard greeting, but if you look through all the epistles of Paul, you're going to see that he starts and ends every epistle with grace. You go to, um, I think it's Romans, let's look, Romans 16, 24. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And so he's, Paul d- does a grace sandwich on every epistle. The bread, right? The outer layer, the bread, grace on each side because he never wants us to get too far away from that concept. See, grace is a divine concept. You talk to any man, any religion, any city, any country, any region, any continent in the world. And, and if you just talk to them and they don't understand the Bible's message, they will not give you grace. No one will ever come up with grace. They will come up with works. You got to work harder. You got to try better. You got to be gooder to get to heaven. The Bible says Jesus Christ was good enough for you. And so as we continue um, next week, we'll pick up in verse eight. Let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you for your message. Thank you for your son who died for us and rose again. Uh, Lord, we, we can't say thank you enough, even coming out of this uh, season of Thanksgiving. As we lead into this uh, Christmas season, um, Lord, we just, we just want to celebrate Jesus. I mean, it, I mean, just the fact that he came, uh, he lived uh, in human existence. He lived a perfect life. Uh, he did all of those things. Uh, he left the comforts of, of heaven. He uh, limited the, the voluntary use of his attributes. I mean, all these just amazing things that we see in the Christmas story, that he fulfilled prophecy um, and he did it for us. Lord, we're just amazed by that. And for those of us who know him, may we be encouraged each day this week to just walk by faith and depend upon the Lord. Enjoy our Savior the way he was meant to be enjoyed. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.